Having looked at differentiation, it is a good time now to begin integration. Now this is a teaching video of simple integration. So we want to look at integration of functions here. Now to begin with, integration is actually the anti-differentiation. What it means is, if you differentiate a function, you get a result. And when you integrate that result, you get back the original function. Let's look at this first one. In differentiation, the index is reduced by 1. In this case, when I integrate, that index will increase by 1. In differentiation, the index becomes multiplier. But in integration, the new index now becomes the divisor. So n plus 1. Then there is a constant, c. So, let's look at this one. If I just, if I just do this, to differentiate this result, I should get back what I see here. Because as I mentioned just now, to differentiate, you get a result. When you integrate that result, you should get back your original function. So, this is the original function. If I differentiate it, I should get back the result here. So, to differentiate, the index becomes multiplier. Then the index reduced by 1, so n plus 1 minus 1 is just n. Here you have the constant denominator. When I differentiate the constant, I get a 0. You can see that cancels off. So I would just have x to the power of n as my result. But looking at the result of integration, the index increased by 1 and the new index now is n plus 1 and it will become the divisor. Now I have put in a condition here so that it's helpful for us to know whether the function is valid or not. You see, if I have a negative 1 for n here, then the whole denominator will become a 0. As you know, anything divided by a zero is undefined. So n cannot be equals to negative one. Applying the same idea over here, the expression in the bracket raised to the power of, I increase this index by one, so n plus one then that new index will become the divisor times. Looking at the expression in the bracket, there is an x term there, ax. So when I differentiate ax, I get just the coefficient a. Then plus c. So two steps there. One, the index become uh, the index has increased by 1 n to n plus 1 next that new index is the divisor also with the fact that the expression in the bracket can be differentiated to give you a so you write a there so these are the steps. 
Bear in mind when we talk about indefinite integration, it means that there is no limit here. You, you don't see any numbers in the integration side. So you would have to introduce this idea of a plus constant. Looking at the condition, uh, n definitely cannot be a negative one. That will become zero. The whole denominator will become zero. So the function will become invalid. Also, a cannot be a zero. So zero multiplied to n plus one will still be a zero. So these are two conditions you have to bear in mind. This is one over x. So when I integrate that, first I have to look. When I differentiate x, what do I get? I get 1. So this is the result of differentiating the x. So the answer I get is ln what I see in the denominator then plus c. So x cannot be a negative 1. So supposing, supposing I do it another way over here. I change 1 over x to x to the power of negative 1 dx. If I apply what I did just now for the first set of integration, I will add 1 to the index. Then it becomes a 0. Then 0 is to be the divisor. And then plus c. You can see the whole function is invalid. And whenever you have such an expression where you differentiate the denominator, you get the numerator, then you have to use ln. By the way, this can be rewritten also in another form. In this form, you can see exactly what the base is, log base e. With this one, you can see if I differentiate the denominator expression, I should get a. But I don't get a there. So I have to introduce 1 over a on the outside. Here, I have a over ax plus b. Now let's look at this again. When I differentiate ax plus b, this is the x term. I get the coefficient of x. So that's a. But I cannot just introduce an a without compensating the whole expression. So this is 1 over a. You can see a times 1 over a is 1. So I have not changed the whole value of the function. It is just 1. But I have to write it this way to prepare me for the next step. 1 over a, then it will be ln bracket a x plus b plus c, the constants. So that will be the result. You can see ax plus b is the expression in the bracket here. Ln e or log base e0 is a no-no. You can actually press in your calculator ln and followed by a zero, it will give you a mathematical error. And also, a cannot be a zero because 1 over a here, 1 divided by 0 also will cause the whole function to be invalid. Next, we are going into the trigonometrical functions. Well, in differentiation, if I differentiate cos x, I will get sine x. 
So now for integration is going the reverse way. When I have integration of sine x dx, I should get cos x. So the result is cos x plus c. Again, we are dealing with indefinite integration. Simple way to detect it is there's no limit on the integral sign. So you have to introduce a plus c. For your result of differentiation of sine x, you should get cos x. Oops, correction. Differentiate cos x, I get a negative sine x. And therefore, from negative sine x, I should get back to cos x. So over here, I should introduce the negative cos. So bear that in mind, it can be quite confusing. So here, when I differentiate the sine, I get cos x. So to go the reverse way, I should get sine x. plus the constant. Next, when I differentiate tangent x, I get secant squared x. So to go the reverse way for integration, you can see here I have secant squared x. So I should get back tangent x plus c. Now the expression are very simple because of the angle. It's basically just x. When you differentiate x, you get 1. So we have avoided actually writing over 1, over 1, over 1 there. But simply telling you the result of integrating sine x with respect to x is just negative cos x plus c. But it's the important point to stress as we go into the next slide. In the next slide you see, we are dealing with again indefinite integration, but with multiples of angle. We are talking about this, ax plus b. So the simple thing is, We'll get negative cos sine integration give you negative cos the expression of the angle ax plus b over this time differentiating the expression in the bracket I get a so that will become the divisor then plus c for indefinite integrals here, integrating cos, I get sine. So, sine bracket ax plus b. Same idea, no change in the expression of the angle. Over, differentiate this expression, I get a. That will be the divisor. Plus c for indefinite integration. For Integration of secant squared, I should get tangent, the expression of the angle, over the differentiation of the expression of the angle gives me just A because of the X terms. So you can see why I stress the point that I had the expression over 1 in the previous slide because it depends on the expression of the angle. We must accommodate that in the results. Next is to look at the indefinite integrals involving exponential function. Every expression to do with e to the power of something. Now, for this sort of function, we rewrite whatever is there, then 
divided by you differentiate the index. Differentiate x because it's x term, I get the coefficient 1. Then plus c. Really for this, nothing is changed. However, for something like this where the index is ax plus b, then rewrite the exponential function over, this time we differentiate this index expression, so I get a, because it's x term. The coefficient is written here, the constant term will give me a zero when I differentiate it. Then, plus c. You can see over here, the condition is clear, a cannot be zero, a is a denominator, if the denominator of any fraction is a zero, the whole expression is undefined. These are some useful results of definite integration. You can see, for this integration sign, you have a, b, a, b. A, A. So these are the limits. The letter A here at the bottom is the lower limit. The B there at the top is the upper limit. This is the upper limit. And here, lower limit. Now it doesn't, mean, doesn't mean that because a is a lower limit, therefore a has to be smaller than b. It doesn't mean that. It simply means if I have a curve here and I drop a vertical line it hits there at x equals to a and I drop a vertical line down to the x-axis x equals to b if I want this region the shaded region under this curve then to integrate from a to B of the fx, I'll get the area under the curve. So integration means where I begin to take the area and where I stop. So the limits actually zoom in on the portion of the area that I need to have under the curve equation. So We'll talk about what happens if I integrate from B to A. That will be in one of the results later. Over here, you can see D over DX, capital F, bracket X, gives me this. So if I integrate FX with a small little F, I'll get back this. So the general idea is if I integrate fx with respect to x, I get back f bracket x plus c. But this is a definite integration. So what I will have is this. Take this result without the constant. And I have to bear in mind putting in A and B later. So you can see for definite integration, the plus C is not necessary. Or because it will cancel out in the process of putting in the A and the B value. So we keep it very compact here. And next, you substitute the B into this function, capital letter F bracket x. So you get f bracket b 
then minus you put in the lower limit into the capital letter F bracket X so that will give you the result the result when we talk about application of integration will be the area under the function over here you notice that for for this function well let me change this to g i need to look at two functions here one is the c f bracket x one is the d the function gx there are two different functions here but c and d are constants just like the a and the b over there so if they are constant the constant c and d can be taken out so here first one c to integrate fx from a to b with respect to x then take out the constant d and then differentiate from a to b integrate from a to b of the gx function with respect to x so you can see one huge expression can be split up into two with a constant on the outside of the integration next you notice that the lower limit and the upper limit are the same whether it is a a b b or whatever else then the result will be a zero now if we go back to this if i integrate from a to a i don't get an area because it is basically the same point i'm taking there's no area at all we continue with some useful results for the definite integration over here you can see we integrate fx with respect to x from a to b if i reverse the order what i mean is from b to a this time i integrate fx with respect to x so i will have to introduce a negative there so that will go in there so whenever I switch the limits around I will have to have a negative so that I balance both sides of the equation next supposing that I use this graph to illustrate the point vertical line down from the curve this a and this is b and this is c and the function is y equals fx and this is y axis and x axis for the first part of integration from a to b i integrate fx with respect to x this is what i get Then for the second part, where I integrate fx from b to c with respect to x, this is what I get. So with two parts like that, I can combine into one so long as lower limit, upper limit, lower limit upper limit is joined to the next integration lower limit upper limit lower limit upper limit so these two must be the same and for all three points of x on the x-axis 
must be a continuous A, B, C. A, B, C. Then I would be able to just write it in this form. Integrate from A to C the function fx with respect to x. So this is a useful diagram for us to visualize how we can actually condense the two into one. Now, there are other expressions which are useful for us and they are from the topics partial fractions. Well, we had actually gone through quite a bit for partial fraction. This is just a summary of it. Now, for partial fraction, if you have got a, an expression like this, f bracket x over g bracket x to integrate. Sometimes it's easier if you can break it down to an expression like that. Uh, because gx is a linear expression, then your numerator will be at a. So for this part, it's more of the fractions that you have to integrate too difficult but you can split it into more fractions and each of these fractions can then be integrated in turn. Next is a repeated linear factor. What I mean is this, if the gx is a linear factor but repeated, it could be squared. So it can be broken up to a over ax plus b, taking only one of it, then b over the repeated linear factor. For c, we have a quadratic factor here, which cannot be factorized. So if it can be factorized, it could be made into two linear factors, then we will not be using this form here. So this is just for quadratic factor of this form. So if gx is x squared plus a squared, then the numeral is ax plus b. So remember, this is useful if you encounter any expression, fractional ones, that you find difficult to integrate then you would use partial fraction to split up the fractions further so that you can integrate part by part. So we have come to the end of this uh, segment of video. Run through it as often as you wish so that you are very familiar with each of the results.